morning, the Lord be with you. Um, let us uh, let us pray. God of mercy, thanks for this time, and this uh, day, uh, even this these hopefully early spring rains um, uh, that might seem gloomy and so on. But we thank you for your life giving power. We pray that you'd uh, give us space and time to sit and think and reflect about uh, the texts uh, that folks wrote uh, to reflect on what you had done 2,000 years ago. We pray that you'd help us to see resurrection at work in these texts, but also in the world around us. Amen. All right, so uh, we're going to talk today about the New Testament and uh, early Christian uh, conceptions of resurrection, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Hellenistic Judaism on the way, uh, and then we, next week we start Lent, of course. Uh, we have uh, Ash Wednesday on Wednesday, and then after that we'll go into an all-call where all the various adult education programs will meet together, and we'll talk about <clears throat> sin. Uh, so our roadmap for that is the first week uh, I'll be talking about sin in the Bible, and so I'll talk about sin and death. Um, and so on. We'll talk about original sin, the whole thing with the serpent uh, in the garden, uh, or was it original sin, uh, the serpent in the garden? Um, maybe Paul thinks one thing, and maybe the authors of Genesis think another. So we'll talk about that, and then uh, and then we'll move into uh, <clears throat> sort of a historical reflection on sin, and I think uh, Benno and uh, Shirley will help us to think through those issues, and then uh, we'll come back to thinking about um, kind of a more systematic view of, of what, what sin and how, how it works in the modern world, um, and in our, in our um, dis discourse as Episcopalians. Um, so then we'll have Easter, our Easter celebration, and then we'll come back to the idea of the resurrection, and we'll start to talk about the resurrection in the church, uh, early church and medieval church, uh, and then in the modern world. So that's, a, that's, our, that's our roadmap for the rest of the spring. Uh, here we are talking about the New Testament uh, and our topic of resurrection. So we've talked a little about the uh, Old Testament resurrection, a little about the, the ancient world um, and the background to, uh, to notions of the resurrection that really emerged in the Hellenistic era. Remember we talked last week about the Old Testament and the Sheol, the place of the dead, uh, where people just kind of go and sit. Um, there are some happy ways to go down to Sheol, uh, or maybe you don't even go to Sheol. It's kind of confusing. It's not systematic, but uh, you, can, you can sort of die full of days, happy with sort of people continuing your legacy, uh, children or metaphorical children and so on, kind of carrying on uh, your, your personage into the future. Um, or you can go to the grave uh, troubled, um, and uh, that's kind of you can you can live in Sheol a troubled death. And so people who died early or uh, without people to carry on their name um, uh, were sort of worried about that, and it was a, it was a tense time to think about death then. So uh, we talked about how uh, in the book of Daniel we start to get a shift towards something like an afterlife that involves resurrection, some sort of bodily exhumation from the grave and some sort of notion of like everlasting life. Um, the book of Daniel, that part of the second half of the book of Daniel, uh, like I said last week, was written uh, really in the, in the Hellenistic era, the, in the era after the time of Alexander the Great, when he conquers the, the Near East and brings with him Greek ideas. People had notions of what Greek ideas were in the ancient Near East before that, uh, but really uh, sort of conceptions of Plato, the Platonic idea of like a everlasting soul, and also Pythagoras, you probably know him from the Pythagorean theorem, who's an amazingly influential uh, thinker and really religious thinker. Um, it was a religious cult based on mathematics. I don't know if you knew that, it's like a mystery cult, really. Uh, and so Pythagoras uh, had this idea of the, the immortal soul, and the, you know, so this, this was a, a new idea. In the ancient world, in the ancient Near East, ancient Babylon, Mesopotamia, um, and ancient Israel, they, they seem to have an idea that maybe like you have kind of a life force that continues after death, but it's very minimal, and it's just not that important. People didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it. But in Greece, they started to develop these ideas of the immortal soul. Like I said, Pythagoras, Plato, and so on. This idea that there's, some, there's a part of you that goes on living forever. Now, this isn't quite resurrection, because the idea here is that uh, you actually lose your body. The Greeks had a dualistic, we talked about this last year with incarnation, the Greeks have a dualistic uh, idea of the world, that they're, the stuff of the world, the material matter of the world, this table, my body, the fleshly stuff, is really kind of lower, it's bad, it's degraded form of spiritual stuff. It's even kind of evil in a way. So I want to get out of my body, I want to get out of this world, and, and then there's this a part of the human being that is really not material, the spirit. Uh, here's the, a little vase from the Greek world from about the 5th century BC, uh, and you have here a little CK, a little like spirit kind of like above this guy, right? So like you have this kind of spirit part of you that is not exactly flesh, it's like not actually flesh at all, um, and it can sort of ascend uh, when, when you die if you've 
and there's different kind of Greek cults that have different ways of thinking about how this works. But in any event, there's, there's, a, there's a beatific afterlife in some way for some folks. Um, we start to see this uh, really emerging within Judaism after Alexander the Great's conquest. We start to see some Jews encounter these ideas in their fully in flesh form. There's a Jewish community that, that, that pops up in Alexandria, Egypt, founded at, uh, you know, sort of at the mouth of the Nile, but also founded after the Alexander the Great, right? So named after him. Um, so this, this becomes one of the biggest cities in the world. It also becomes the hub of Judaism. There's actually way more Jews living in Alexandria than there are living in Palestine um, right around the time of Jesus. I mean, there's this huge Jewish community, a, mi a million Jews, perhaps, I mean, up to. Uh, so they, they, you know, the uh -huh. estimates vary widely. Um, but this Jewish community has authors like Philo, that you may have heard of Philo of Alexandria, and this, the, they are um, mystical. The What's that? Was he the dough guy? Dough? <laughs> Philo, Philo dough, yes. No, well, Philo, yeah. Uh, yeah, sort of, uh, yeah, cl close. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> but he, so this, this guy uh, writes about kind of a mystical, uh, Judaism that's really informed by Greek thought. So this kind of Greek-informed Judaism where the, the, you're really trying to get out to the spiritual world and so on, the kind of uh, the, the, the Torah, you're supposed to interpret it kind of allegorically. Like, you're, like you know, you're supposed to kind of read it and be like, this isn't really about real people. It's about like my soul and how my soul gets out of my body and so on. So this kind of Judaism uh, uh, sort of begins to, to form. But also there's, a, there's something about Judaism, it's not a dualistic religion at heart. That is, it doesn't really believe that there's a soul that's separable from your body. So in other words, there is a part of you that's like your personality, but they call it your nephesh. Uh, it's often, whenever you read the word soul in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word nephesh, which actually means your throat. It's your throat. Why throat? Why does this mean like your soul or something? It's because that's where you, where you breathe. And that's where your spirit is, right? The breath that God, God breathes breath into you, into the human in Genesis 2 and creates them. It kind of makes them like not just lumps of uh, inner clay, but, but things that have a life. So the life force is the breath that you draw in and, ex and, and ex expel. But at the same time, it's like the breath itself isn't the life. It's like the fact that you're breathing is the, the life force. And that's your nephesh, your throat. So it's a physical material part of you, your soul. Um, the, you know, the spirit is a part of you. It's a thing. And if you die, your spirit doesn't just kind of keep on marching on, um, it, it dies. Or it goes into some reduced state and show, or you know, can't really communicate very well. So this physical, this emphasis on the physical continues in Judaism. So there, like I said, there's some Jews that just kind of abandon the idea of the physical body and the physical resurrection and so on. Um, then there, there are Jews, this is a, a picture, this is a Greek Orthodox um, uh, icon. But it's depicting a book that uh, we actually have in our sort of deuterocanonical Bible uh, as Anglicans. But if you go to like a Lutheran church, they'd be like, that's okay. But if you go to like a Presbyterian church, they'd be like, no, we don't read that book. This is the book of 2 Maccabees. So 1st and 2nd Maccabees are books that some Christians count as kind of uh, inspired and some Christians say just aren't. Um, uh, Jews don't use this as sacred literature, by the way. But it was sacred literature for many Jews at the time of Jesus. It falls out of, uh, out of sort of favor within the Jewish community after the time of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So this is a story from 2 Maccabees chapter 7. And it's in your Bibles. Most Bibles have this in like an appendix or something like that. 2 Maccabees is a really interesting story about what happens uh, in the year 167 BC to 164 when there's a persecution of the Jews. I mentioned this last week. One of the Greek kings kind of goes crazy and persecutes. Well, he, I don't know, I don't know if he goes crazy or not, but he, he imagines that Judaism, the religion, is a bad thing and needs to be exterminated from the earth. So he tries to eradicate the religion. So this is the story of how that happened. Uh, it's, you know, what we might call like fictional, fictionalized, right? But it's uh, depicting actual events. And one of the fictionalized probably stories is there's this woman uh, who has uh, seven sons and uh, they're all tortured to death. And as they're being tortured to death by the Greek king for being Jews and being proud Jews, um, they say things like, we believe our body will rise up again. You're torturing us now but God's going to have the last laugh because my fingers and my hands and my, my eyes are going to come back and I'm going to laugh at you on the other side of this. Um, so that, that there's a belief uh, sometime around uh, the time of Jesus in this uh, real materiality of the resurrection within the Jewish community. And this is kind of a split, I think. There's, there's, uh, and we can see this actually in Jewish culture. It's um, dramatized between these two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Y'all ever heard of these folks? Mm -hmm. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? So, so this, uh, yeah, right, yeah. But, but, you know, oftentimes we'd be like, kind of throw them together. They're all one big group. Actually, this was probably, and I say probably because it's a little, 
hard to get like good clear sources about this. Everyone who writes about it seems to have a bone to pick. Like they, everyone's got a, you know, it's kind of like asking people today, like what are Democrats and Republicans? Like you held very different things from different sides. So you kind of see this in the ancient literature. But from the best we can understand, uh, these are two actually very different groups of people who were actually very much opposed to each other. So at the time of Jesus, there are these groups that have evolved. Uh, they evolved after the time of uh, the, the uh, return from exile. And over a long period of time, you get these folks who are the Pharisees. These are lay leaders. This is like your vestry, right? Um, they, they go throughout the community, and they teach people how to follow the law. But they try to help people follow the law in their own day, like day-to-day like -day life. And they see themselves as making the law easier to follow, more accessible. And it's for everyone. They also have a lot of beliefs about the, the resurrection. They, they tend to believe at the time of Jesus, at least, that the, the body is gonna, everyone's body is going to come back at the end, only at the end. So at the very end of days, God will raise up the, the righteous, the faithful, and give them flesh like the book of Daniel says. Um, uh, and then, of course, there'll be judgment for those who persecute, especially the Jews. So th these are the Pharisees. Um, the Sadducees are probably, and I say probably because it's actually really hard to figure out who these people are, but uh, probably based on uh, the best rec reconstruction of the sources that we've got, um, they're elite, powerful people, wealthy. They probably have connections to the temple leadership. And theologically, they seem to have uh, absolutely no um, belief in the afterlife. They seem to really read the first five books of the Bible, that is the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So like, they, they, they really have like a constricted canon, a constricted theology. They don't like these Pharisees walking around telling everyone how to follow the law. They kind of don't care about that. Um, they are also tend to be complicit with power. So they tend to uh, favor the Maccabees or even like kind of conspire with the Herodians. Uh, these powerful uh, folks um, who are actually running, running Judea. Uh, so in any event, these, these two groups would have been at odds. They, they, in the story of Jesus, they, they combine sort of forces. They find, it's almost like, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Jesus is the enemy of both of these groups. So they conspire against him along with the Romans, and then the Romans crucify him, of course. So this um, kind of power rift or whatever between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was also, like I said, a theological rift and, and about resurrection. So Jesus gets some hard questions about resurrection in the temple courts, and it's precisely so that he can be made an enemy of one of these groups. So, uh, so Jesus' answers about resurrection um, kind of put him more in the camp of the Pharisees. This is also just true in general. Jesus seems to be very closely related to the. He would have been a Pharisee when they call him rabbi, teacher. Like he would have, like he would have probably not even been like someone outside the Pharisee group. He would have been a Pharisee, um, just like Paul says he was a Pharisee at one point. But Jesus was a Pharisee who was kind of different and had an internal critique of the Pharisaic movement. This is why he hate, like he comes off as hating the Pharisees. It's because he's one of them and he's really mad about the way that this group has sort of transformed over over time. He thinks that they're actually being too rigid and so on, they need to be more lenient, more open, more welcoming to the people and so on, especially to people like tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, and so on. So in any event, this, uh, this is a kind of an internal crisis. And after a while, the, the, the Jesus followers get booted out of the Jewish community for being kind of too weird. Uh, and when that happens, then these texts that have already been written as kind of like you know an internal critique of Pharisaism, they end up being read now as an external critique which then leads to a lot of anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, and so on. So in any event, this is a, um, I mean, there are a lot of debates about how this works too. But anyway, um, there's another group of folks that we can read about, these Pharisees, these Sadducees. Uh, Sadducees, of course, connected to the temple probably more, more closely. Um, and then you have uh, these, these groups of what Josephus calls these the Essenes. Josephus was a first century uh, Jewish historian. Uh, there are other folks who call these folks the Essenes as well. Um, but we're not exactly sure how the Qumran folks, the Dead Sea Scroll folks, um, how they're exactly related to the Essene community. They seem to be related to them in some way. But this is like uh, a crazy person sect. So John the Baptist is probably one of these folks uh, living out in the wilderness, uh, sort of uh, pr probably uh, uh, trying to remain pure as much as possible. So a lot of this like, ritual bathing, the baptism thing, ritual bathing, like a mikvah, right? Um, a lot of uh, kind of thinking about the end times, a lot of dualistic theology, apocalyptic theology, a lot of talking about demons and devils and so on. Uh, a lot of uh, talking about the end, the end is nigh kind of preaching, like John the Baptist. Um, you got you to change because the end is coming. Um, these folks also tended to be very separate between genders. Uh, they probably didn't have sex. They probably were you know, thinking that was a kind of a purity issue for them. Um, but they also had some power. They had wealth, and they had a lot. They had a scriptorium, and these, these kind of uh, 
books, these scrolls, end up being hidden in massive quantities in these caves. These are the caves near Qumran, um, probably having to do with trying to hide them from people, the, the, Roman, the Roman army trying to take them. Um, but you can see it's kind of in the Dead Sea areas, kind of would have been more fertile back then, so they would have had farms and stuff, and they would have actually had money um, to support themselves as kind of monastic community. But also, they were, they were trying to separate themselves from power and from Jerusalem to be more pure. Yeah. Is the ritual bathing a weird Jewish sect thing? No, no, no. Was, okay. Yeah, it's normal, it's typical, okay. but they would have done this uh, religiously, but also they would have attached more, well, I say religiously, they would have done this a lot more often, but also they would have attached kind of a, a, a bigger significance to it. I mean, you, uh, Jews bathed themselves in a mikvah before going into a holy place as a, as a way of kind of cleansing, right? This would have been understood to be like an apocalyptic cleansing. John the Baptist making you dunk in the river and coming out and telling you you're a whole new person, right? Everything's changed for you. That's a, that's a different model. Um, uh, of, and also in the Qumran community, there was probably kind of a sense that this expels demons and things like this. So in any event, there's a kind of bigger sense to what this whole water thing does, if that makes sense. So, so these folks who live uh, at the Dead Sea, there's the Jordan River, by the way, here's Jerusalem. So they're not too far from Jerusalem, they're pretty close, in fact. Um, but they're separated by, um, like, the, they, they've built a little community where they can live by themselves. Now, these Essene folks also had kind of branches that seemed to work within cities. That is, they had, like, almost like missionaries, um, like living in the towns of the, of the area, walking around and talking to people. So Jesus seems to have some connections to these folks, too. Uh, that is, he knows John the Baptist. Um, he has a little rivalry with John the Baptist, though, if you read the Gospels carefully. Um, but also, he talks about apocalyptic end time stuff, and he talks about renewal through baptism. So there's, you know, he goes through the baptism ritual of John the Baptist. So there's this, uh, Jesus seems to be kind of like dabbling uh, in both uh, Pharisaic and uh, Essene kind of ways of, of thinking about things. Now, the Essenes had uh, a very dualistic um, kind of uh, uh, like a good and evil kind of way of thinking about the world. The world is a battle place between good spirits and evil spirits, and they're trying to get in you and change the way you think uh, and, and act. Um, and, and your eternal soul is like in the balance of how you respond to these different evil forces that are fighting fighting for you. So they, they do believe in an earthly kind of uh, bodily resurrection. Um, and they seem to have been an influential sect at this time. So, uh, Evan, do you have anything else to add about the Qumran community and their thoughts about resurrection, afterlife, or anything? <coughs> Uh, one thing that's coming to mind is you're talking is that might be worth clarifying. Yeah. Like their worldview is it's just that uh, there's a transition, it seems, in the sort of the way that uh, the other like identities formed in Judaism during yeah. this period. And, and Qumran represents a move from like talking about us as Israel mm -hmm. and them as like the nations or mm -hmm. foreigners to like us as us here at Qumran and them as just evil birds in general. Like, so the yeah. The nation falls under that, too. And like, the Sadducees are bad people. Right. Like and anybody who's not quite participating with this project and hasn't been initiated mm -hmm. is, is not on the board with this. So they, they also, I think, it, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, there's an atoning function yeah. in their way of life for the rest of the world and the rest of uh, Israel, mm -hmm. is, which is a very sort of fundamentalist thing to do. There's this, yeah. like, we're the most sorry, so we're the best. You know, yeah. We're, we're the most <laughs> we, we humble ourselves the most, and yeah, so we're the greatest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and, and also, so maybe the first uh, kind of truly sectarian movement um, right. in Israel since, like, since the, the, the Yahweh alone folks, um, mm -hmm. you know, like Elijah. So yeah, yeah, so this like true sectarian group, like, you know, there's uh, the, uh, the Sadducees are evil, like, and they're not, they don't really count as part of the good people um, because of what they believe and so on. So anyway, yeah, so great, thanks. Uh, so uh, Paul emerges in this, and I'm starting with Paul because Paul's writings are the earliest Christian writings we have. Um, they, they predate the Gospels by about 20 years or so. Um, Paul's writing career probably starts sometime in the late 40s and goes through the 50s, um, AD or CE. Um, and uh, here's, by the way, uh, Paulos. So here's an early um, uh, Greek painting of, of, of Paul. Um, but, if, but if we look at Paul, Paul's got a, a very kind of different way of thinking about resurrection um, from some some of the other uh, folks that, that, that are responsible for the Gospels and the other Christians. Now the Gospel writers are probably, they probably have access to Paul, at least some of Paul's theology and Paul's writing. So you can think of the Gospels as in a way, a little, like kind of correctives to Paul and Paul's theology. So Paul is really the first Christian to write a whole bunch of stuff that, that survives. Uh, so we, we, we can get, get a sense for that early Christian community. We can also get a sense for um, like what Paul is taking from people uh, from other Christians before him. So we have access to even some stuff that's like pre-Paul, some stuff from maybe like, you know, Jesus 
dies sometime in the 30s uh, CE, uh, AD. And then Paul is writing in the 40s and 50s. And then Paul is using some stuff that's been around from before him. So we have access to some really early Christian stuff through Paul. And one of these things is the book of Romans. So if you have your Bible, turn to Romans. It's about three, well, about maybe like eight, nine tenths of the way through the Bible. I love how the New Testament works, right? Just a tiny little appendix stuck onto the Old Testament. So, um, but uh, uh, so if you, if you open one of the Gospels, keep turning. Romans is uh, just after Acts. It's the first and longest of the Pauline letters. And so it's the first letter included in the New Testament just after the gospel. So you've got the four gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you have Acts, which is kind of like the second half of Luke, split up from Luke because John is the last gospel, and then you get the stuff, post-gospel stuff after that, and then after Acts is Romans. So we've been up to Romans 1. This is a letter that Paul writes to the community of Christians in Rome. He's never been there. We actually don't quite know that he ever meets these folks. Uh, we, we, we believe he goes to Rome at some point um, and probably dies there uh, as executed, but whether or not he gets to actually meet with the Roman Christians, we don't know. But so he's writing to a group he's never been to to clarify some stuff. Uh, so in other words, he's, you know, Paul is uh, the missionary par excellence. He wants everyone to have a good idea of Christianity, and of course, the good idea of Christianity is his own, right? Um, so his, his view is balanced in the New Testament by other folks. Um, some people hate Paul. I really actually like Paul a lot, but also you got to kind of, some, some things about in Paul you got to you got to take with a grain of salt. So in any event, uh, uh, if you start with this uh, chapter 1, verse 1, here's, here's the letter. So it's a letter written to these folks in Rome from Paul. Uh, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son. And then from here on out, we think that this is Paul quoting an earlier psalm about Jesus, or a creed, or some, some kind of earlier thing. Now, why? Because he says some stuff that he never says anywhere else in his letters. Paul doesn't actually talk about Jesus as the son of David. Never talks about David. Really kind of dislikes that whole theology. Uh, for, that, for, 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 Jesus, for, for Paul, that, that makes Jesus too kind of individual uh, to, a, to a particular people. He likes this kind of universal gospel. So, but, any event, uh, so he, but he mentions David here, and we think it's for him to like kind of get some street cred with the Roman church. He's probably quoting like a Roman creed or something like that. You know, in other words, he's like, I know your story. Now let me help you with it a bit, right? So, uh, <laughs> so uh, verses 3 through 5. Okay, so, so the gospel concerning his son, who descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all Gentiles for the sake of his name. So this, uh, this little bit, is, uh, who was descended from David according to the flesh, we talked about that in our incarnation class. This is probably the earliest known um, reference to the incarnation in writing. Um, so like the, there's the, kind of the fleshly part of Jesus, but then also that he is in some way God. Uh, Son of God by power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. So you also see this earliest reference that we have, this kind of probably like earliest creed we've got in writing, also talks about the resurrection of the dead. That is, the earliest Christian communities seem to be focused on this stuff. And that word resurrection, by the way, it's like, you know, standing up, like getting up. It's like, you know, the bo it's very bodily. It's not like spirit kind of floating off into the, the nether world or, you know, the heavenly world or whatever, leaving behind your disgusting body. Um, so in any event, this kind of dualism of body, um, the, the, the Greek dualism of like the bad body, the good spiritual stuff. Paul seems to be quoting an earlier, really very Jewish um, way of thinking about Jesus uh, that is insistent on the physicality of Jesus' resurrected body and probably thinking about our resurrection at the end as well. So this, uh, this bit about resurrection, maybe there's a lot more that Paul says about resurrection even in this letter, um, but we've got to move on. Uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians. So if you just keep, turn all the way to the end of Romans, Keep turning, keep turning. You'll get to 1 Corinthians, which is a long letter. And you go to chapter 15. Um, 1 Corinthians is, of course, famous for uh, the reading that everyone has done at weddings. But there is more in this book than that chapter. Did you know? Did you know? <laughs> there is. It, 1 Corinthians doesn't just have one chapter in it. So, in any event, um, love is patient, love is kind. I know, I know. But turn to 15 with me. Okay. So, uh, this letter is a big kind of grab bag, probably, of, of stuff that Paul's responding to in the Corinthian community. Um, Corinth is a huge Greek city, really, really important. Uh, also, it seemed to have been a place where um, there were very wealthy people who started to follow the Christian gospel and very poor people who started to follow the Christian gospel, and there seemed to have been divisions between them. So Paul's really writing a letter saying, hey, treat everyone the same, please. Uh, but then also there was some stuff going on that was kind of uh, awkward. Like, it seems like there was some, some 
sexual relationships between family members that maybe Paul was upset about. Um, but anyway, so Paul writes this big long letter to try to talk about ethics and, uh, and about kind of uh, equality and justice and so on. And then he gets to this part where he talks about the body. There are a lot of Greek, like I said, wealthy Greek, very well-educated folks who say, but the body is disgusting. How can we worship a God who is resurrected in body? That's gross. So Paul writes this big long chapter trying to explain to them, here's how it works. Yeah. Had Paul met the Corinthians? Uh, probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, he founded that community. Yeah, exactly, right. So but Paul had been to Corinth uh, and knew, knew these folks. Um, I think, the, is Romans the only letter that he writes to a community he hasn't been to? Yes. So, right? I mean, yeah. So anyway, um, so yeah, Paul's, Paul, Paul knows, these, knows these folks. In fact, he refers a lot of times to like when he, how he founded the community and like, you know, I, I gave you this gospel and now it's like you've kind of twisted it around and stuff like that, whatever. So, but in chapter 15, he says, um, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received and which you also stand. So here, like you got the good message, right? Uh, through which you are also being saved. And this is one of those times where I point out that salvation is a process, but it's also something that actually happens here on earth. It's not just... You know, you are being saved. It's this outworking of God's power in the world. Um, salvation is a life. It's a life that we're living right now, or not. Uh, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what in, I had in turn received. In other words, like Paul's, again, one of these early Christian guys who uh, has received a message from, the, from those earliest Christians. Um, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to, appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. By the way, women are left out of the story here. It's as, 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 this is probably, like again, in one of these early Christian kind of creeds about the resurrection. And the Gospels get written, and the Gospels, all of them are insistent. It wasn't just the guys, and it wasn't the guys who got it first, right? So in any event, this, uh, uh, the, the Gospels seem to fill a bit more of the story in here than the early church um, in their kind of creedal structure had held on to. This is if Peter, Cephas here. Um, is the first one to see. So then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to what untimely board, he appeared to me. Paul never met Jesus in the flesh. So Paul uh, was someone who's had a vision of Jesus. It appears in, in Acts. Uh, it talks about this, but also in Paul's letters, he mentions some kind of something that happened to him where he had some kind of transformative encounter with Christ. Um, so Christ appeared to Paul in some way, but with the, with the spiritual body, like with the body of the resurrection. For I am least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. This is that story in Acts, right, where Paul was Saul at that point, um, and uh, at least in the narrative, he's Saul, uh, and persecuted Christians. Now, but by the grace of God, uh, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them and so on. So he's, he's a good guy, right? Um, one thing that's important here is that he does mention some people have died since they met Jesus. Paul is an apocalyptic thinker. Jesus was an apocalyptic thinker. Uh, while Paul is alive, he's thinking that the end is coming soon, within a generation. Why? Because the resurrection is an apocalyptic event. Remember Daniel 12? The resurrection happens at, what po at one point in time? At the end. Uh, for the Qumran community, for all these ancient Jewish communities who thought about the resurrection, the Pharisees, the resurrection is an end time event. So if Jesus popped out of the ground, end is coming. The end is nigh. It's soon. Paul talks about it this way. Um, the Gospels talk about it this way. It's about to happen. Now, of course, it doesn't quite happen. A generation, two generations go by. Paul says, some people started to die. This has started to make people question this. And Christianity transforms from an apocalyptic community <clears throat> with like very near-term horizons about what the end is going to be like into a community that says, ah, Jesus was a harbinger of the last, Jesus' resurrection was a sign of the beginning of the last age, which goes on for who knows how long. So in other words, it's a transformative moment. It's like the end has kind of popped up into history at the moment of Jesus' resurrection. But now we're all living this kind of last age, and who knows when, when that ends. So this is the beginning of Christian theology where the end is like the kind of foretaste of the kingdom of the end has appeared in time in Jesus' resurrection to give us hope to continue on for generations. So in any event, Paul is kind of struggling with that here. When, when you read this stuff about Paul, he's like, yeah, we're not going to die, basically. <laughs> like, uh, we're going to see Christ before the very, very end. Uh, he really thinks that. Now, he's wrong about that, but uh, in any event, that, doesn't, um, uh, that, that didn't bother early Christians who then had to look at his letters and say, we've got to reread those parts. We've got to think about that again. So verse 12, back to Paul's letter. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? So some Corinthians are saying, no, that's a bonker 
stupid. Like, you know, our soul flies up to heaven and that's it. Uh, we don't have any gross, bodies are gross. We don't like gross bodies. Uh, if there's no resurrection of the dead, though, Paul says, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain. And then your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. <laughs> so here's Paul making his argument, right? He's going into what we might call a diatribe. Uh, so he's like, like putting out an idea. Well, some people say this, but I say this, right? You know, he's going to just like, and so Paul, this is Paul's way of argument, ar arguing. Um, and uh, every once in a while, he'll ask himself questions to keep himself going. Like, is it not true that? No, by no means, right? Um, <laughs> So, uh, so then verse, let's get down to verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. See, the first fruits. He's already starting to think. Not everyone popped out of the grave at the same time. Just one person. But Jewish theology at this point, if you were a Jew that believed in resurrection, you believe that everyone pops out of the end at the same time, and it's the very end. Why just one guy? Paul is developing a theology here called the first fruits. So what are the first fruits? Anyone know? Bring your first fruits. That's what you sacrifice, right? That's what you sacrifice. It's an important sacrifice. Why first fruits? It's the best. The, okay, the best, maybe, but they're the first. So what are your first fruits of your garden? That is, what pops out first out of the ground? Seeds. Yeah, the seeds, right? They pop out. What's the first fruit you actually get? Or whatever. I'm not tomatoes, right? Yeah. Radishes. What's that? Radishes. Radishes, onions. Yeah, you get some. Some like those are your first fruits. The first stuff, the first stuff that pops up that lets you know that hey, this is working. The soil is good. Like the ground is working. Whatever. And those are the things you bring to the temple in the ancient Judaism. Your first fruits to show like hey, like it's working. Like it's good. Let's have a party with like uh, the beginning of. So it's, a, it's a first taste of the future growth that's going to happen in your garden. All that good stuff that you're going to have at the moment of harvest that hasn't come yet. But this is a foretaste of that. So Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. You get how that analogy works? Mm -hmm. Jesus is the first thing to pop out of the ground that shows us what's going to happen. This is a foretaste of the future. You all can have hope because we've seen it, but just with one person. So, uh, so the first fruits of those who have died. For since, uh, chapter 15, verse 21, for since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. We'll talk about this. Uh, this is the notion of original sin, or at least uh, Pauline notion of original sin, right? That death enters into the world, and we'll get to this, like I said, next week, um, through a person. And that person is Adam, right? Not Eve, although, like, you know, a lot of Christians will say, like, it's Eve, right? But uh, Paul talks about how Adam, Adam's the bad guy, right? Verse 22, for us all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at, the, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So again, like, Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. Jesus will come back. Where is Jesus? Well, the ascension, right? Jesus kind of comes back, but then he's like, oh, I'll see you all later. And then in the ascension, Jesus goes away. So Jesus' physical body is not here on earth. But there is a physical body of Jesus on earth. Of course, Paul says this several times, including in Corinthians. Where is Jesus' physical body on earth? Church. Us. The church. <coughs> Us. It's the church. We are the body of Christ, Paul says, actually, in First Corinthians, right? It's like, we are literally the body of Christ. If you want to see Jesus, touch Jesus, you have to, like, and it's not just one. It's not like me. I'm Jesus' body. When we meet together, when the church meets together, prays together, uh, works together, helps each other together, we become magically the body of Christ on earth. Sort of like the, the bread, uh, you know, at the moment of consecration. Um, you become Christ. So, so does that encourage us to hug each other all the time? Sure. Yeah, I mean, you're hugging Jesus' toe or something, you know? Like, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, the, the, that's the, the whole idea is that, like, when, you know, together we, we form something uh, that's, that's bigger and better than any one of us, uh, and it really is connected to God, God's power on earth, God's presence on earth. Um, so, in any event, uh, but this is all tied to this problem of death and sin. Again, we'll get to that next week. Um, uh, verse 24, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all the enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So Jesus is popping out of the grave, has something to do with the destruction of death, but it's like a delayed time bomb. You know what I mean? Like Jesus has already beat the power of death through resurrection, his own resurrection, but like death remains this kind of hobbled power. Almost like Germany in the last days of World War II, right? Like they're, they're, they're gone. Like you know, they're, they're not going to, like, be in power again, but, like, where, where was Hitler? In the bunker somewhere? There's some troops running around somewhere. The Nazis could still inflict harm in the last days of the Third Reich, but they couldn't win the war anymore, right? The last, like, month 
of it was just mop-up operations is another way to say it, right? Um, the kingdom of death is like that, according to Paul. Um, it's been given a mortal wound by Jesus' resurrection, but it's been allowed to continue to have some sort of modicum of power over the human body and, and over all of us um, until this very end moment. But don't fret. It's already, like, the victory's already been won. So, anyway, that's, that's kind of what he's saying here. And Jesus is going to put all these enemies under Jesus' feet. Now, you might think, like, is that like Bob or, you know, is Babalu the enemy? Or, you know, who are these enemies? Like, can we name them? Can we, like, you know, pick them out of the room, right? No, it's not like that. You know, these are the principles of, of, of the, 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 the principalities, right, that Paul talks about, these, these cosmic enemies, uh, evil, right, anger, uh, the murder, right? Uh, the sort of death is the final one of these enemies, right? Um, uh, hatred, uh, uh, injustice, racism, right? These are the enemies, these cosmic enemies that Jesus is slowly putting under the divine feet, right? To rule and to destroy. Uh, and then verse 27, for God has put all these things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain this does not include the one who has put all things in subjection under him. So Jesus is not like one of those things that's underneath God's feet, like Jesus is kind of with that. So this is Paul defending that Jesus is still important. Okay, now let's skip down to uh, verse 35. But someone will ask, someone has asked in this community, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Gross. <laughs> Fool! <laughs> I, love, I love Paul here. Fool! You jerk, right? Uh, for what you sow does not come to life until it unless it dies. He's got another agricultural metaphor here. So, he says, uh, now the, the big debate is like, does your, just your body come back? Like, look, if my body just comes back, like Lazarus's body came back, guess what? I die again. This thing has problems with it. Like, it's gonna fall apart eventually because of like the laws of whatever, thermodynamics and stuff, right? You know, things just fall apart, right? Uh, so well, what am I gonna, if my body gets raised up again, like poor me, like my body's gonna fall apart again. So Paul says, it's, you know, so either you fly up to heaven as like a spiritual soul or your, your nasty body gets resurrected again. Okay, what, so, so what? Well, Paul says, no, no, it's not quite like that. It's more like a seed. Verse 37, and as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. Not all flesh is alike, but there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one thing and that of the earthly is another. Kind of sounds crazy, but what he's trying to say is, okay, I get that like your earthly body is bad in some ways. It's good in, in most ways, right? But like you know, all of our livers eventually will fail. Like if they if we live on long enough, right? Uh, everything wears out. What do we do with this worn out body? Paul says, okay, so think of it like a seed. The seed goes into the ground, and does like a big a big seed pop up out of it, or does it keep on going being a seed forever? No, it turns into something that grows, right? Uh, it turns into a different kind of thing. So we're like a, um, a, a surprise, like, you know, like, like we're a seed, like our earthly body. We don't lose our earthly body. It transforms into something bigger, better, life-producing. So the stuff, the matter of your body, it, it counts, it matters. It will be the stuff of your body uh, after the resurrection, but it will also be transformed into something new something different, a different quality, a different order. Um, so this is, this is the way he's talking about it. Verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. Indeed, star differs from star in glory. So here's this early cosmology here. Um, uh, maybe maybe uh, Paul Wallace over at Agnes Scott would want to uh, argue with him, but anyway. Uh, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. This is his way of saying like dishonor as in like, yeah, like all our bodies fall apart and die, I'm sorry. It's just the way it works. It's like not great, but at the same time, it's the stepping stone to the kind of blossoming of your actual body in a new way. Verse 44, it is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. Paul's using a special word here that it doesn't mean like um, it's just your uh, immortal soul. It's not just that language, like uh, unphysical. A spiritual body is still a body, and it, the Greek word here is it's still referring to kind of like a thing, a body. Um, so there's, in Greek thought, you have your flesh, your sarks, like the stuff of your skin or whatever. And that's not, he's, he's saying that stuff will transform. You won't have your same sarks, your same fleshly body. It's going to be transformed into a spiritual body, like a new kind of thing, a new spiritual soma, like a new, a new form of, of flesh, a new, new type of thing. Um, almost like, uh, you know, when you, like water freezes, it goes through a phase transition. You're going to have a phase transition. It's an awesome kind of matter. Yeah. 
Brendan, we think the Old Testament prophets were channeling the word of God somehow. Do we think Paul was doing the same? How does he know? Uh, so, how, yeah, how does he know? How does he know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, this is something that like, a lot of Christians like don't actually think that much about. Like, what you know, so inspiration, right? Um, and this is oftentimes treated in pretty like uh, I don't know heavy-handed ways. Um, the, like that Paul is somehow inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these letters. The mechanics of that like are oftentimes passed over in silence or like aren't talked about very much. Um, but honestly, I think that like Paul writes a lot more than what's in these letters. So Paul writes probably hundreds of letters, most of which end up in the trash bin of history. What was in those letters? I don't know. Um, but why these letters? These letters were saved, just like the four Gospels. There were more Gospels. Like, why, why are these four important, or why are these letters of Paul important? Why are they still in our Bibles? It's because so many people found them important and recopied them, which is an expensive thing to do back then, and passed them around and saved them. And in times of persecution, which didn't happen often in the, in the Roman Empire, in fact, like Christians weren't always hiding in catacombs. In fact, no one ever hid in catacombs. They were registered places for burials, so like everyone knew where they were. Um, but anyway, uh, but so when early Christians had times of persecution, uh, there, there were times, like under Domitian in North Africa, where they had to like kind of show their scrolls. And which ones were you willing to die for? Which ones were you willing to like get hurt because you had in your home? The Epistle of Barnabas is like a really important early Christian text. The Shepherd of Hermas is a really important early Christian text. They're not in our Bibles because in those times of persecution, people are like, not this one. <laughs> it just what didn't end up being as important over time. So uh, part of it is Paul, and like is Paul receiving kind of messages from God? Or is part of it that the validation of the community over centuries is the thing that ends up kind of proving what's important and what's not within the Christian tradition? Um, and it's, again, there's no like church council that makes this decision. In fact, there's not a church council that makes a decision about what's in or out of the Bible, about the canon, until the Council of Trent in the 16th century. That's the earliest decision about what's in or out of the Bible. It's all just kind of tradition until then. So in other words, it's not like one master, like Constantine, like deciding, like, oh, this is going to be in and this is going to be out. It's, it's literally the church as a body that's having these arguments and fights about what's important or not. And there's certain groups that lose out, the Gnostics, sorry. Like, I mean, uh, you know, the, we, we, we preserve their, uh, like their, their texts are preserved through archaeological finds, but they're, like, the community itself was well, persecuted, kicked out, and so on. So, like, there are parts that get kicked out, but it's not just one person making these decisions. Um, so, in any event, I think that's probably another way of thinking about how the inspiration works in this context. Not just Paul, but also the people who heard Paul, and were like, this part of Paul, not that part of Paul, you know? Um, uh, this, this letter is good. This letter is worth, worth passing around. This letter is not. Um, and also, like, 2 Corinthians seems to be a grab bag of a bunch of different letters that Paul sent the Corinthians that they stitched together, which means they also probably cut some parts out. So it's interesting to think about, like, how this actually, the, the function works. So anyway, there's a lot more to say about that, but, but uh, so, uh, uh, Paul continues to talk about the resurrection and, and the, the, verse 50, let me just say this. Uh, what, am I, what I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, your fleshly body, something's got to happen to it first. Nor does the perishable inherit the imper imperishable. In other words, if you want to like have an eternal life, you can't have it with this body. Paul's like, I get that because of physics. Um, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Here's a little bit of Paul's apocalypticism. He thinks that some people are going to survive and not die until the end. Well, Paul's off by a few thousand years probably. But anyway, um, uh, but, but he, nevertheless, he says people will be transformed. Again, here's that like phase transition moment. Um, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. Like people's bodies will still be their bodies, but they'll be changed. For this is perishable body must put on imperishability, the mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. This is from Hosea, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? So again, the victory's already been won, but at that moment, like, you know, death will finally be given its 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 final end to its power. The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's Paul's way of thinking about death and resurrection of, of Christ. Uh, Paul tends not to talk about the life of Jesus very much. That is like Jesus, Jesus did miracles. Paul's like, I don't care. I don't really care about Jesus' miracles. Jesus fed the 5,000. Paul says, it doesn't really matter that much to me. Those were signs to help people understand that he was important. Paul's like, if you think Jesus is important, don't, don't spend your time thinking about the miracles. Spend your time thinking about the death and resurrection, because that's what's important. So for Paul, Jesus is God who came and died and was risen, and that's the story. The Gospels seem to be written as a response to Paul. 
Remember, Paul's written at least 20 years before some of these Gospels. The Gospel writers are like, I like Paul. Mark probably even is like, you know, kind of, in a way, a bit of a response to Paul. But at the same time, they're like, but you got to have the stories. <laughs> the stories of Jesus are so important, right? Because the next generation comes along, and they might not believe that Jesus really is the Messiah. They might not, they might, they need to hear the signs and miracles again. It convinced the first generation, but like, what about second, third generation, fourth generation of Christians? So the, go the gospel writers, the older folks in the community who, who remember these stories, who were there for it, they start to say, i got to get this down because Jesus isn't coming back tomorrow. Like they start to understand that this, what's called the parousia, that Jesus' return is not going to happen tomorrow. So they have to like get this stuff written down for the, net, for the, for, for the future posterity. Um, and that's why we have the Gospels. Uh, Mark, there's a, a early Christian tradition that Mark is in some way um, related to uh, uh, Peter. Is it, it preserve Peter's stories uh, when Peter's about to die or something like that? Who knows? No one really knows that. But it is unusual that it depicts Peter in such a negative light, but he's still clearly supposed to be the head of the church. So that has, is what has made people think that Mark might be related to like, Peter's lineage. Um, you know, the fact that it depicts, like, who, who would allow themselves to be like, the, still the head of the church but depicted as a fool so often? Maybe Peter himself. So that's where that thinking comes from. But for whatever reason, uh, Mark's gospel um, is also, people, a lot of people think, uh, tied in some special ways to Paul's teaching, precisely because it is a, a very extended passion narrative with a little introduction to it. So the miracles of Jesus, the stories of Jesus are actually pretty small in Mark, pretty short, compared to Matthew and Luke, which lengthen. So in, in, in Mark, there's no birth story of Jesus. Where is it? I don't know. It's just not there. It wasn't important to them. Uh, there's, not a, there's not a whole lot of detail with a lot of the miracles. Mark's a lot shorter in that regard. Um, the other gospels tend to like fill in stories. So Luke is like, Mark forgot some stuff that was really important to have in there, right? Uh, but so in any event, um, this might be because, you know, Mark might be related to Paul's teaching about uh, that really the important part is the death and resurrection. So if you look at, at the end of Mark, uh, turn with me to, oh, we're almost at time, sorry. Turn with me to Mark uh, chapter 16. So if you're at 1 Corinthians, turn back a little bit, uh, and the Gospels go Matthew, then Mark. If you hit any of the prophets, um, then you've gone too far. Uh, so Mark chapter 16, the very end of Mark, right before the beginning of Luke. Um, you'll see that chapter 16 starts when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary Mother James and Salome brought spices so the men go to anoint him. All of the gospel writers are insistent that the women saw first. So they're correcting that early Christian creed that like it was Cephas, it was Peter who saw first. No, 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 they say. It was the women who saw first. Um, and very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They'd been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us at the entrance of the tomb? Well, when they looked up, they saw that the stone was very large and been rolled back. So they're going to prepare the body. Jesus has died as a state criminal. He's been executed publicly. Um, these women are going to care, care for the body. Uh, when they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. So there's a big stone in front of Jesus' tomb. It was gone. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. He said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus at Nazareth. He was crucified. He has been raised. So Mark still has this pronouncement that Jesus' body is gone because Jesus got up. That, word, that, that verb literally is stand up. Like Jesus stood up and walked out of here with his own two feet. That's why the body's not here. Now, the body also could not be there, might not be there because the Romans stole it because they don't want it being used as like a martyr object, right? They, like a, as a rallying point for people to rebel, they executed him as a, as a rebel. So that, that's like, you know, some people are like, well, why was Jesus' body not there? Maybe the Romans took it and burned it or threw it away or whatever. Or maybe uh, it's not there because uh, somebody else stole it so that the Romans wouldn't take it and that they would like preserve it and keep it and whatever, so on. Um, the, the, the issue is that Jesus' body never pops up anywhere else that we know of. So in any event, the, 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 mirror, the mystery goes on, right? So verse 7, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out to the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone. They were afraid. Period. That's the end of Mark. Other people were so disturbed that the ending of the Mark was like no one saw Jesus. <laughs> people only heard that Jesus was like up and moving around. And then they fled away, afraid, period, end of story, <laughs> um, that they ended other, they added other endings. We know these are not the original endings because we have manuscripts without them that are early, and then later on, these endings start to appear. And these endings are synthesized from the other Gospels. Uh, these, you can see shorter and longer endings of, of, of Mark. So both of them have stuff about Jesus' physical body and so on. Um, the other Gospels, sorry, we don't too much time to go into these, but you can see in Matthew and Luke, there are lots of additions to this story. In other words, Matthew and Luke come later than Mark, 
and they add lots of stuff that they think, like Mark really wants to end this story with uncertainty and with terror. Because probably for Mark, this is an important way to end the gospel story because then it, puts, it asks you, what's your reaction to this? What, how do you feel about this? And Mark is, is big on irony, is big on like kind of subverting your expectations about things. Um, Mark likes to build tension into the story. And that seems to be kind of somewhat absent in Matthew and Luke where there's lots more foreshadowing and the story kind of ends with much longer narratives. Uh, so in other words, Mark might have said, I know there's lots of stories about Jesus out there, but I really want to end it with people scared. Um, <laughs> Ma Matthew and Luke don't like that. And so they, they add in lots of uh, additional narratives at the end. Matthew, of course, has the ending where Jesus tells his disciples, hey, listen, the, the, there's going to be the sheep and the goats at the end and so on. But just kind of you know, teaching about the, the end and the resurrection and the judgment that comes. Um, and then Jesus tells his disciples at the end of Matthew, hey, listen, go and baptize all the nations in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and so on, and go out and, and, do, and do this good work. Uh, Luke does similar things. Remember, Luke has this kind of meeting in the, uh, the, the walking to, to, to Emmaus, the, the traveling to Emmaus. Um, where Jesus' physical body is there with folks, but they can't recognize him. They don't know it's him. And this is a recurring thing in both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I mean, Matthew uh, and Luke and John, um, where people can't quite recognize Jesus in his resurrected state. This is kind of like Paul saying with the body, right? It's going to be your body, but it's going to be different. It's going to be a little, a little weird, like I can walk through walls or something like that. You know, Jesus appears places, but also there's an important part of the Gospels, and Paul doesn't talk about this, but the Gospels do. Uh, at least uh, Matthew and Luke and John do, um, that Jesus' body still has wounds, um, still has stuff like from his suffering in it. That is, the new body doesn't do away with the suffering or make it never have happened. It's not like a bad dream you wake up from and you know, it's, it's gone. Um, the, the suffering of this world actually exists in, in the hereafter in some, some transformed way. So in any event, it's another way for us to think that like the Gospels are trying to tell us, hey, the stuff that happens on this earth really matters. If people are being hurt, try to stop them from being hurt because that hurt doesn't just go away, even in the year after. So in other words, like, it matters today what, what we do to people and how we act. It's a, it's a way to think about the ethics of this world without being like a clean slate. Um, so anyway, those are, those are some dimensions to, to, to Christ in the Gospels. Um, but that sense, all of the Gospels end up pointing to this notion uh, after Mark of the Ascension. So Matthew and Luke and John all have a moment where Jesus kind of goes away. Like there are moments where you can come across Jesus in like a gardener or someone walking along the road to Emmaus or whatever. But after that, Jesus' body is not here anymore. It's somewhere else. And the substitute for that in the book of Acts is, is the church. It's us. It's the community. It's just like it is in Paul. So that's the, the era we live in now, is the era of the church, according to uh, the, the, the community of Christ, according to the, to the New Testament. Okay, so again, we'll, we'll dive, do a deep dive into sin and death, um, talk about the, the crucifixion uh, next week. Um, and then uh, after all this, we'll come back to the early church and we'll revisit this question of the resurrection, what happens with the resurrection in the early church. Um, and uh, uh, how, does it, how does it actually work for early Christians when they start to ask these questions again after Paul? Questions, comments? Uh, feel free to leave. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. We'll go to the staff.